Don't you hate it when something gets in your way? I was reminded that I'm preaching through this series, Get It Out of Your Way, on Monday morning. As the boys and I turned on Highway 28 East to get them to school, I noticed that traffic was running a little bit slower than normal. Soon we found out that there was a wreck in front of Walmart, or the Walmet, as Rebecca calls it. Once we finally got past that and we got on the expressway heading over to Alexandria to get Zach to Rapids Academy, we were running a little bit later than normal, but we got him in line. The line seemed to move a little slower, but still, we were okay, and I headed then to Paradise to take Zach to Paradise, uh, Evan to Paradise Elementary. We got him there about 10 minutes later than normal. I got Evan settled for his first day of school, got back in my truck, got on the highway to head to the church, and wouldn't you know, I ran into another wreck at Procter & Gamble. I sat there thinking, this is like one of those dreams where you can't get to where you need to go. Finally, we got past that. I finally arrived at the church a good 20 minutes later than, than normal during the school year. And it was just frustrating. Had to sit there a minute just to breathe and, and get ready for the week. Don't you hate it when something gets in your way? Now, obviously, things like wrecks on Monday morning are out of your control. You just can't do anything about that. But as we've been talking about in this series, there are some things that get in our way that are controllable or at least movable with the Lord's help. Already we have uh, talked about how we sometimes get in our own way. Last week we talked about how sin can get in our way. And this morning I want to suggest another it that can get in our way, and that is misplaced priorities. Having the right priorities is important. One of my pastors told the story where he bought a ceiling fan brush. Maybe you've bought one of those. The tool's designed with a telescoping pole, and it's got brushes around it so you can clean the ceiling fan blades without getting on a ladder. And so my pastor got that out. He unpacked it. He put it together, and he noticed there were instructions for this duster. Step one, turn off the fan. When you establish priorities, you put the things that should be first in their proper order, even if that should be obvious. And so this morning, I invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to the Old Testament prophet Haggai. The book can be hard to find. It's very short. In fact, it's barely two pages in my Bible. The easiest way to find it is go to the New Testament and then go back three books, and you'll be at the book of Haggai. Now, whenever you look at an Old Testament prophet, you've got to situate them in the Old Testament story so that you will be able to understand what's going on. So for simplicity's sake, let's bring break the long Old Testament story down into just eight major events, starting with creation, going through the time of the patriarchs, to the exodus, then the conquest of the land, then the developing of the nation, then the divided kingdom, the exile, and the return. Haggai fits into the last section of the Old Testament story, the return when the exiles returned to Jerusalem. Remember that Babylon had destroyed Jerusalem in 587 BC. That is one of the things that started this time of exile for these people we're talking about. And part of Babylon's national policy was to take the conquered people of one place into exile. So they would take the people from this area where they conquered and move them somewhere else. And the reason they had this policy was because it would be hard for those displaced people to unite together and to form a revolution against Babylon. So in 539 BC, though, less than 50 years after Babylon had destroyed Jerusalem and taken the people into exile, Babylon itself was conquered by the Persians and their king, Cyrus the Great. In the same year, Cyrus issued a decree that allowed all the Jews to return to their homeland if they wanted to. Now, one might think that there would be a mass exodus of Jews from Babylon to head back to Israel, but there was not. In fact, there were many reasons for that. First, uh, about all there was to the homeland was land because their homes, their fields, their businesses, the temple, it had all been destroyed. And so it was going to be hard work to rebuild everything. Second, Other people had moved in, and that would create conflict. And third, many of the Jews were comfortable where they 
were in Babylon. Most had been in exile for 50 years or longer. Many of the original exiles had died. Those born in Babylon were comfortable uh, with where they were. Most of the people who had been exiled to Babylon had taken the prophet Jeremiah's advice to heart when he said, look, you're going to be here a while in exile, so you need to just uh, settle down, plant gardens, marry, have children, live life. And so over the years, as Babylon had prospered, the Jews that were living there also prospered. We need to remember that the exile period was not like these Jews were in concentration camps like the Nazis had in World War II. They were just not home. They were in a foreign land, but they were able to live however they wanted and to have a life. So many of the people stayed behind when the edict was made. However, Almost 50,000 decided to return, and that's a small number compared to the big number, but it's still a pretty good number of people. In fact, it's just a little bit greater than the population of Alexandria. So when this group arrived, they faced the challenges that I just mentioned and even more. In addition to the hard work of rebuilding, the people faced opposition from neighboring peoples. They faced opposition from Persian officials that were stationed there. They even faced discouraging remarks from the older people among them who said, well, things just aren't like they used to be. And with all of these and other issues pressing, it's no surprise that the returnees felt comparatively little urgency about rebuilding the temple and instead poured their energies into reconstructing their own homes and restoring their agricultural production. And that impacted them personally, far more, they thought, than the temple being rebuilt. But see, here's the problem with that. They needed the temple to be rebuilt because it was essential for their worship. It would be a testimony of the faithfulness of God to return his people from exile. So to leave the Lord's house in disrepair was to disrespect him. But the initial returnees did little more than clear the foundation and set up an altar in the courtyard. Despite the real difficulties they faced, the people were just making excuses for not rebuilding the temple. So as Haggai comes on the scene, it's been about 20 years since the first exiles returned to Jerusalem. They've rebuilt their homes. They have made good progress on their fields, but no work has happened on the temple. The people of God didn't have their priorities right, and God was tired of it. And so to remedy the situation, God raised up two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, who urged the people to reset their priorities and to build the temple. Haggai's message is going to give us today some focus points to help us for getting misplaced priorities out of our way. And the first focus point that I find here is that misplaced priorities never lead to satisfaction. Look at verses 1 through 4. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltael, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? It's interesting that Haggai's message came on the first day of the month. Because according to Old Testament law, the first of every month was a time of special offerings to the Lord. And so it was a time when you would celebrate and rejoice. And guess where you do that? At the temple, which wasn't there. And so, the Lord brings this word to the people. And verse 2 strikes at the heart of the matter. Haggai doesn't spend time on any non-essential ideas. He doesn't introduce himself or anything. He cuts right to the chase. He says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. And what did God say? He said, basically, your excuses for not rebuilding my house are no good. The people's excuse was simply that the time had not yet come. Apparently, they'd been saying this for years in defense of their inactivity whenever someone would say, you know, we really probably ought to get back to building on the temple. Someone else would say, yeah, but I just don't think it's time yet. 
In the people's eyes, their excuse was not apathy. It, it wasn't selfishness. They would eventually get around to rebuilding the temple, but the time just wasn't right. What did they mean by that? They could have meant many things. Scholars have suggested various ideas, but all of those ideas really boil down to the issue of priorities. We all find ways to do what is important to us, regardless of our time and our finances. If it's important, we figure out how to do it. So they could have done it too, but the temple and the things of God were not their priority. Themselves and their things were their priority. Think about it. For almost 20 years, the people had been focused on themselves. They had broken up the ground. They had planted crops. They had rebuilt their homes. Some, even in spite of the economic challenges, had built fine paneled homes for themselves. And so God's saying, look, don't tell me you can't afford this, you don't have time, or you can't do it. You can, you do, you're just not. As I thought about this story, I was reminded of one that uh, John Alley told me. Many of you remember Brother John was pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Alexandria for many, many years. And uh, when they were re preparing to relocate Calvary from uh, at Jackson and uh, Bolton Avenues down to their current location, uh, obviously there was a lot of concern over the expense of that relocation. Even though there was no parking, they were greatly landlocked, nobody was, would sell them property, and they were just stuck. So as they dealt with that issue, John Alley in his uh, typical John Alley fashion went out on a Sunday morning during Sunday school and he just walked around the church parking lots. He walked up and down Jackson Street and Bolton where all their people were parked and he wrote down the make and model of all the cars that were parked there. During the next week, he looked up the value of all of those cars. And so he was able to then go to the church and say, look, we can and we should do this. Because on any given Sunday, there's X number of hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of cars in our parking lots. Don't say, we can't afford this. We can and we must. And of course, we know that they did. And the Israelites could too. God is saying through Haggai, for 20 years you've been in hot pursuit of everything but me. And what that had caused was contempt in the heart of God for his people. In fact, he calls them these people in verse 2 instead of my people. The relationship with God and his people is not good because they have their priorities wrong. And contrast that now with the situation that happened some centuries before. David was king. And remember, David had grown concerned that he was living in a fine paneled palace, but God was still in a tent because they were still using the old tabernacle that Moses had built. And David wanted to build a temple for God to, to really be fitting for God. And God said, no, you're not going to build it, but your son will. But now we fast forward into this time period and the people have the houses. God doesn't even have a tent. He just has a slab and unlike David, the people don't care. Look at verses 5 and 6. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Misplaced priorities never lead to satisfaction. The things of this world pass through our fingers like grains of sand. They never satisfy. No matter how much you have, it is never enough. Misplaced priorities lead to everything from busyness to undue stress to pressure to financial debt to prayerlessness. Only God can satisfy. Only God. Until you realize that, you'll always have that it in front of you. But if you will find your satisfaction in God, the other things will fall into place. Jesus said that in Matthew 6. He said, you don't need to worry. You don't need to be stressed out about all these things you need, even things you want, because you need to just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to you as well. The people were living in fine houses while the temple was just 
a slab. They were busy about their own houses when they should have been busy about the house of God. And they were not satisfied because misplaced priorities never lead to satisfaction. We also find here another truth, and that is misplaced priorities dishonor God. Look at verses 7 and following. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Again, give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine and the oil, and whatever the ground produces on men and cattle and on the labor of your hands." The Lord says that he had desired to take pleasure in the temple and to be honored by it. And though the people had expected much by doing things their own way, they had come up wanting. And Haggai explains the reason for that. He says, your economic and financial difficulties that have come on you are because of your own lack of obedience. And consequently, the divine judgment of God has come upon you because of your failures in maintaining proper priorities. This has all come on them because God says, as in he does in verse 9, because of my house which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with his own house. In the Berlin Art Gallery, there's a painting by 19th century German painter Adolf Menzel. And the painting is intended to show Frederick the Great meeting with his generals before an important battle in the Seven Years' War. And Menzel uh, painted most of the generals in the background first, apparently, and he was leaving the king until last. And Menzel intended to give an intense and physical sense of Frederick's generals. And so you can see they're painted as really stocky and strong, and they kind of stand out against the winter landscape. Unfortunately, Menzel died before finishing the piece, and art scholars have debated why Menzel never painted Frederick the Great, the central figure of the painting. Some have suggested that the king's thinner frame uh, would have made Frederick the Great not look so great as compared to his generals, and Menzel did not want that effect. Whatever the reason, we really don't know. But for all of history, uh, Frederick's generals now will stand looking intently at a thin, ghostly sketch of their leader. The king was to be remembered and honored by this painting. Instead, he is forgotten. Uh, That painting can be a reminder to all of us that too many Christians come to the end of life without ever having put Jesus in his proper place. Uh, The things around us, where Jesus should be in our lives, may appear strong and and they may be ready for battle. But without a leader, they're staring into nothingness and they become meaningless. The one who should be honored is forgotten, even dishonored, because misplaced priorities dishonor God. And so there must be better news in this biblical account, right? There ought to be something And there is. Because in this passage, we also find something wonderful. And that's this focus point. Proper priorities. Welcome the presence of God. And that changes everything. Notice what happens here. Verses 12 and 13. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheltael, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. Notice, everyone from the leaders to the citizens of the city decide to obey the Lord. The time that they thought had not yet come apparently arrived. And they were ready to do what God had called them to do. A fear of the Lord came upon the people. An awe, a respect, a realization that he's indeed in control. And suddenly, 
with that one act of obedience... Haggai's message of reprimand became a message of blessing. You notice that in verse 13 where God's word is now, I am with you, declares the Lord. I'm convinced that the greatest asset of any person's life is not his or her finances, it's not his friends or acquaintances, it's not his talents, his skills or friends. The greatest asset in any person's life is the presence of of God. Without Him, you can do nothing. But with Him, you can do anything. Psalm 18 verses 28 and 29 powerfully captures this truth where the psalmist writes, you Lord keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. Proper priorities welcome the presence of God. And that changes everything. Writing from jail to the church in Philippi, remember the Apostle Paul said, you know, I've learned that wherever I am, in whatever circumstance, I can be content where I have a lot or whether I have nothing, whether I'm free or whether I'm, I'm in jail. And because of that, he could write in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because... Proper priorities welcome the presence of God, and that changes everything. But whenever I consider a truth like this one, I'm brought again to Micah 6, 8, where we see these words, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Because in the presence of God is where we find all the resources of God. The comfort we need, the peace we need, the wisdom we need, the provision we need, the direction we need, and so much more. And when you have all of that, you can then walk humbly with your God, enjoying the presence. Because proper priorities welcome the presence of God. And then you get to experience that next part of this truth. And that changes everything. That's exactly what happens in Haggai's day. Look at verse 14. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Sheltael, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came, began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. The people got the misplaced priorities out of the way. They put God in his proper place and doing so pleased him, of course. Consequently, God was with them and then that changed everything as he started to influence every area of their lives. He inspired them. And did you notice who all he inspired? That he inspired the spirit of Zerubbabel, the governor, Joshua the priest and the whole remnant of the people. So notice, the Lord brought influence to the governmental leaders, the religious leaders, and all of the people so that his work could be done. And that led to good fruit, good works, the people getting to know God in a better way. They, he's known as their God in verse 14. We see the relationship is coming back together. Haggai's challenged work. The work returned on the temple because proper priorities welcome the presence of God. And that changes everything. What is amazing to consider is that the events of this book are confined to a period of three and a half months. Think about that. Haggai ministered for three and a half months. We're talking about it 2,500 years later. In that brief time, Haggai was able to move his community from stark apathy to vigorous action. They had lived with misplaced priorities for 20 years. But in just over 20 days... The people got their priorities right. And they began the work. And instead of experiencing hardship, they started to experience the blessings of following God. What's crazy is, they just started doing what they knew they should have been doing all along. They put God first, and that changed everything. 
That got me to thinking. I wonder, what would happen in your life if you finally (laughs) just did what you know you should have been doing all along and put God first? What would happen if you reset all the priorities of your life and put God first in every place? First on your calendar. I'm going to commit to worshiping the Lord at the first day of the week. And I'm going to commit to spending time with God every day. First on your calendar. First in your finances. I'm going to commit to to tithing and supporting the Lord's work. First in your relationships. How you treat others. How you love your spouse. How you raise your kids. First in your business. How you do your business. How you handle clients and customers and students and colleagues and all of that. First in your words. How you talk. What you post on social media. First in your thoughts. If you would just... Simply do what you already know you should do. What would happen? If we would just simply do what we already know we should do. What would happen? That begs the question. Why don't you find out? 